I wish I could be with everybody for the Sages meeting in the great city of Cleveland, but instead I'll record this for y'all. I'm in my usual pandemic outfit, of a mask and scrubs. I have nothing to disclose about recurrent perisophageal hernias. Again, I'm gonna talk about the surgical techniques in the repair of recurrent perisophageal hernias. Recurrent perisophageal hernias have a slightly different clinical presentation. Many patients can be totally asymptomatic. At the time, if somebody had come back to me a decade after somebody had done a hernia, they're now 80 years old, they have no symptoms, but it was found on a screening cardiac calcium CT scan. Again, they may be asymptomatic. They have vague symptoms, such as external chest discomfort, postprandial fullness, anemia, or you can have acute presentations with bleeding, perforation, volvulus. Again, what are the indications for repair? It's the same that I almost use when they present initially with a perisophageal hernia. If they have symptoms, we'll do something. It also depends on their age and their comorbidities. There's bleeding problems, dysphagia, weight loss, incarceration, vomiting, aspiration, respiratory problems. Those are reasons for surgery. How do I work up these patients? Many times they've already come to me. Um, one, I may have done their first perisophageal hernia. Uh, I firmly believe in barium swallows on everybody. I like to assess the esophageal length, the, grace, the gross motility of the esophagus. As you can see in this chest x-ray, you know this is a problem based on that large gastric air fluid level in the chest. That's not a hard one. That one's gonna need a repair on this recurrent. This picture, and you'll see other pictures of her throughout this area, was a fourth time recurrence um, that I've recently done on her. I'll get a barium swallow that's sessy esophageal length and look for gross motility. Again, I think everybody should have an endoscopic evaluation before surgery. And that's really important make sure that we're not missing something else. Make sure there's something else that we need to take a look at, such as camera and ulcers, and esophagus, or of course, a malignancy in these areas. Manometry is a little difficult. A recurrent perisophageal hernia, I don't get it routinely. I do do a very close barium swallow. If I have questions about dysphagia, I'll obtain one. Many times it's technically difficult. When I start doing recurrent perisophageal hernias, I do not routinely do a anti-reflux operation on them because of the problems in this whole area. Occasionally, I'll get a gastric emptying, but again, if you have recurrent perisophageal hernia that's symptomatic, probably because the stomach up in the chest is not emptying well, and that'll give you kind of a false gastric emptying study positivity rate where it's not emptying well, it's stuck in the chest. 24 pH studies, again, is usually not indicated for these reasons for the recurrent perisophageal hernias. The surgical approach, it's, it's important to be prepared for longer surgery. It could be more difficult. Uh, patients in my standard setup, my standard trochers I would use for any Nissen. I think it's really key that I, I, I have an endoscope in my room at all times. I may take a look early. I may take a look in the middle. I may take a look at the end. I want to take a look and make sure I'm not having anything. Again, this is interesting. This is the, the previous gastropexies on a patient. You can see they just elongate, similar to what you see after a peg's been in there for a while. You may have these adhesions. Fortunately, this patient did not have too bad of adhesions from the previous surgery. Dissection and reduction of the perisophageal hernia, I go with where it's easy. When I'm doing a primary Nissen or primary perisophageal hernia, I always start on the right, go posteriorly. And these, I'm gonna look where there's an opening. And this patient, you can see, and it's fairly common in recurrence, be lateral and anterior uh, for many reasons and, and why it's in this area. But that's what tends to occur. I always uh, do endoscopy if I'm worried at any times. And interesting in this case, you can see that upper hiatal hernia. And then there's a second one uh, below here, so uh, just fat uh, herniating up the chest. Uh, so you have to look around, make sure everything is reduced, and, and really just take your time while doing this. Some of the key points is that I always take down the previous wrap. I think uh, it helps me see the anatomy for my area. Uh, many times a wrap will be in the chest, so. Once I start mobilizing everything down, and again, in this case, you can see the esophagus, part of the previous wrap that I'm gonna undo. And I always like to say is that when taking down this wrap, I, I expect at times that I may have a hole in the wrap. It's better to have a hole in the wrap uh, than in the esophagus. And sometimes even if it's really fused on a loose wrap, I may use a GI stapler just to separate them and seal off both sides, then unwrapping the wrap to help take down everything if I can. It really, at the end of the case, and I, I laugh at looking at this one, as many of you say, yes, this is recurrent perisophageal hernia. I don't know what was done, but not much was done because it was a pretty easy dissection. 
again, I want to make sure that I have uh, the esophagus in the abdomen if I can mobilize enough. Again, that's part of the re reason to prevent recurrent hiatal hernias to have nice intra-abdominal esophagus. Pearl closure is very important. And again, I'll try to close it posteriorly. Occasionally, I'll use pledgets. I'm a, I used a non-absorbable ethabon sutures and endo stitch for that. And occasionally, I'll close posteriorly if we can, but sometimes I'll have stitches anteriorly, out laterally to close the hiatus in this entire area. To use mesh or not to use mesh, again, the advantages is it's reinforcement to decrease early recurrences. I am not a big mesh person. I will use it when it's necessary, mostly on the recurrent ones. Uh, as long as you bring it together, I'm also worried about the effects of the mesh, the foreign body area there. Uh, there's an inflammatory reaction when I'm redoing a patient that's had previous mesh. There's no doubt that there's more inflammation, even if it's absorbable mesh in that area. And again, it's a, that diaphragm is a dynamic area. And I'm worried about erosion into something else or dysphagia of the mesh around the esophagus. Uh, when I do use mesh, obviously, I'm not going to use any polypropylene. I, I tend to don't use any gore. Uh, many of us maybe 20 years ago used gore, but I, I don't think I would recommend either of those products now. Again, I'll probably use a bioabsorbable uh, mesh of some type that's available. Mesh placement, and again, this is a previous picture of that patient here. I've mobilized the esophagus, the wrap is undone. Here's my intra-abdominal esophagus. The stomach is here, and I'll have a U-stitch of the mesh that'll suture in on both sides, and one posteriorly. I'll also use glue to fixate most of this area. Again, we shouldn't bridge that defect. You should close the defect on these patients. And here's another uh, case. This is a patient with a, a transverse colon stuck in the chest after a total esophagectomy with a gastric pull-up. And again, this is uh, the colon up in here. You can see the stomach here. The defect is there. It's surprising, the colon came down quite well. And you can see the large defect here. But as you can see, it actually came together fairly well. But I would not trust this enough. And then I added absorbable mesh to cover this area, glued it on along with a few stitches to cover that area. A short esophagus. Um, in my career of doing so many of these over the last 25 years, I would say that um, I don't believe there's a lot of short esophaguses where I'm going to do a lengthening. I can count on one hand how many lengthening procedures I've done. Usually I'm more concerned about the effects of a lengthening procedure because I'm really making a gastric tube in the chest. And if I can at least give them a small sliding hyaluron, that's probably more appropriate. The key thing is a very adequate mobilization on these patients. If I was going to do a, uh, on a redo areas where I have to redo a lengthening, I'm usually going to just resect out this, a wedge fundectomy, because that part of that fundus, it's all up in the chest, enlarges and has a problem. So it's not that uncommon, or many times when I bring this down, I'm going to take off part of that, that old fundus that's all raggedy after we take it all the way down. So other, you know, this is kind of my key points in this brief presentation. I'm sure if we're all in Together, you'd have a lot more questions for me. But the key points is you have to have an intraoperative endoscopy. If you're not taking a look with the scope yourself, it's going to be because um, sometimes you just don't know where you're at. And it's good to look around. It's good to see and make sure you're in the right area. I always take down the previous wraps that are up there. Um, I always like to say when I'm taking down previous wraps or doing this, a hole in the stomach is better than the esophagus. And so I will err many times when things are stuck to the esophagus on my uh, stomach area. And again, I, my feeling is I'll tend to put in a gastrostomy tube a lot more frequently than I'll ever do a lengthening um, to help fixate it, to straighten it out. And then somewhere where I may uh, think that I have to do a lengthening, I want to make sure I have enteral access. Again, I'll tend to put a gastrostomy tube in a very old recurrent or large hiatal hernia or symptomatic one, a patient that's really old. And again, the key is really patience. Um, you want to make sure that you're taking your time, you're identifying your anatomy, now go from side to side, and looking around, and slowly get that recurrent perisophageal hernia down. And again, at the end of the case, um, maybe some mesh to help every, help prevent any problems. Again, with this, uh, I wish you guys were all in Cleveland uh, for this. Cleveland's a great area. I was born and raised here. Uh, I'm sure we'll be back here sometimes. I look forward to seeing everybody again. Uh, with that, thank you for allowing me to talk a lot, a little bit about my experience with recurrent perisophageal hernias. Again, uh, my contact information, feel free to email me if you have any questions whatsoever.